Welcome to Film Detour, a podcast where two longtime film buddies take you down and around the back alleys and side streets of cinema. With the occasional left-hand turn. I'm John Knapp. And I'm Bob Muller. So let's go. John, you ready? I'm ready. Let's hit it. Okay, this week's episode, The Getaway. Sam Peckinpah, 1972. We've been wanting to do this for a while. Oh, John, I've been uh, wanting to do this since I'm 12 years old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love this movie. Yeah, so Sam Peckinpah, he's a, he's a great director. It's kind of a modern Western, maybe, but people associate him more with his Westerns. But if uh, you think about it, this is really kind of a different movie for him. This is more of a, a, a straightforward crime drama, and he just does a beautiful job in it. Um, so he's got a long career. I mean, he, he, he goes uh, way back. Yeah, he did some a lot of TV. He Gun, actually was a Gunsmoke. writer. I, I didn't yeah. know he was more of a screenwriter for a lot of early stuff. He started as a writer and yeah. he, he did Gunsmoke. He uh, was the creator of The Rifleman. He actually directed episodes. Yeah. He did another show, The Deadly Companions, with Brian Keith. And then he's really known for one of his early westerns, Ride the High Country. That's a great movie. Have you seen that, John? I have seen it's it. It's a great um, movie. Joel McRae yeah. and Randolph Scott. Yeah, yeah. He, he used these old Western, yeah. classic Western Absolutely. Um, and he kind of totally revised the Western in, for that day, 1962. Right. right. And then he had a big dud with Major Dundee. Uh, well, what, what do you think was a dud? I don't, well, first of all, there was a lot of things behind that production. They didn't really have a script. It kind of was. What do you think he's Fellini? It was supposed to be a big movie, and it got out of his hands, and the producers basically took it away but from But the him. studios cut it like, yeah. to ribbons, right? Yeah, because yeah, yeah. it went over budget. There was a lot of stars. and It just didn't work. That's too bad. I mean, it was very ambitious. And he kind of was hard. He had a hard time finding work, and then he got he did The Wild Bunch. Yeah, and that which, really shot him to the stratosphere. Yeah, that it's just, just kind of changed the Westerns. And his style came into focus there, his kind of slow motion violence, I'll call it for now. Right. But you know what's interesting, too? He, he, he also, one of his favorite movies, if not his favorite, uh, was uh, The Ballad of Cable Hogue with Jason Robards. Jason Robards, Robards yeah. And it's much more of a gentle type Western. Yeah. Uh, he loved Westerns. There's he, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And, and of course, right after that, Straw Dogs. Straw Dogs is a really weird movie. That's yeah. a, a very strange psychological th- thriller. Uh, it, it, Dustin Hoffman's great in it. Yep. And it's it's got a lot of gray areas to it. So I, I like, that, like that movie a lot. Junior Bonner. Junior Bonner with Steve, Steve McQueen. McQueen. Yeah, um, terrific movie. Terrific movie did not make a cent. Really? Yeah, Steve McQueen was like, of all the movies I made, that movie made nothing. I can't believe it. Yeah. Wow. And the Peckinpah of Peckinpahs, uh, Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia. Yeah. <laughs> Warren, Warren Oates. Oates. I love that movie. I John, think that's on our list. It's going to be on a list, John. Yeah, yeah, you bet. Absolutely. Right after Junior Bonner, he did The Getaway. He needed to make money. And this script came along by Walter Hill. And, you know, just to jump over now to Walter Hill, the screenwriter, you know, look at the credits on this, John. It's really yeah. ridiculous. You got you got, uh, you got got Steve McQueen starring in it. Yeah. You got Walter Hill writing the screenplay. You got Lucian Ballard doing the cinematography. And you got Quincy Jones doing the music. Yeah. You know, what else do you need? Yeah. And Peck and Poe directing. So Walter Hill uh, adapted this from a Jim Thompson novel who did The Killer Inside Me, and he wrote The Grifters. Right. Uh, famous dark noir writer from the Absolutely. 50s. Yeah. And then, as you said, Lucen Ballard, as the cinematographer, he had a long career starting in 36, but he did a lot of a lot of Peckinpah films. He did Ride the High Country, The Wild Bunch, Ballad of Cable Hogue. He's just a top-notch cinematographer. And, yeah. you know, whether he's doing westerns or crime dramas, this, 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 it's beautiful stuff to watch. And one other thing he did in the 60s that's kind of very antithetical to The Wild Bunch was True Grit. Totally different kind of movie. Such a Good Hollywood movie. movie. But yeah, yeah, but very Hollywood, as yeah, you said. Wow. Yeah, wow. And then, of course, the score, Quincy Jones. Mm-hmm. You're the expert on Quincy Jones. Well, uh, just to give you an idea of Quincy Jones, he started out, he worked with, with Count Basie, and he was doing, yeah. when he was young, doing arrangements for uh, Frank Sinatra. Um, obviously, he was the producer. He must have been five. I mean, the guy's yeah. been around forever. Like <laughs> he, he was the producer of Michael Jackson's two biggest records. Right. Off the Wall, the first big one, and, and Thriller. And, right. and he also did a, a lot of soundtracks and... He did a lot of television shows. Hmm. Uh, the theme for Sanford and Son, that's Quincy Jones. Wow. Yeah. Well, the interesting thing about the music in this was Peck and Pa, he had Jerry Fielding, who did the music for The Wild Bunch okay. and Cable Hole. He had him do the soundtrack for this. Okay. Steve 
McQueen's agent is the producer on this, and so he had a little bit more control. Okay. He didn't like it, and he had he got Quincy Jones wow. to do this. The theme music is good. The main theme is really nice. That song, cool. no doubt about yeah, it. Yeah. I think it's a great soundtrack. Um, yeah. And the reason I feel the way I, it, it it has this just funky, edgy quality to it. And the way right. he, he plays the harmonica with that. Right. So let's go, Steve McQueen, star of this action movie. Yeah, Steve, the man. Steve McQueen, I, he is a movie star. I mean, he walks on the screen. You cannot take your eyes off right. him. He has so much presence. Right. He is the coolest guy. He <laughs> is. He, he is, is the coolest ultimate guy. Cool. Yes. And he started back, he did a lot of television. He did Alfred Hitchcock Presents, yeah, the Goodyear Playhouse, those Playhouse yeah. 90s type things. And he did one of my favorite television series, Wanted Dead or Alive. He was the star. Oh, my God. Yeah. What a great show. Yeah. And he's the coolest guy in that, and he's got the coolest gun. That's and fantastic. then uh, he went on to star in The Blob. The Blob. Classic horror. Yeah, even though he was about 35 at the time, I think, I still buy him as yeah. that teenager. Because it's just, it's Steve McQueen, and I'm ready to go. Where he, wherever Steve McQueen wants to take me, sure. Uh, he went on into The Magnificent Seven. Right. One well, of his early films. Yeah. Big hit. Hell is for Heroes. Hell is for Heroes. Uh, the Great Escape. One the, of my all-time favorite movies. The classic war movie of all war movies. <laughs> and the motorcycle scene. Yes. Uh, Love with a Proper Stranger. Yes. With um, Natalie Wood. Natalie Wood. Yeah, that's a really great movie. Yeah. A lot of great New York City scenes in that. Right. The, the footage is all done in New York City, and it's it's great stuff. And then a movie Peckinpah was supposed to direct, but uh, it went to uh, someone else, Cincinnati Kid. Great stuff. Um, the Thomas Crown Affair, Bullet. We were just talking about Peter Leach just the other day. Peter Leach. And um, one of my favorite movies of his, The Sand Pebbles. I love the Sand Pebbles. You have to revisit that movie. It's a long movie. It's a very long movie, but it's really great. Robert Wise? It's got Richard Attenborough yep. as an actor. He's terrific in it. And it's got Mako. Mako. Now, if the movie has Mako in it, <laughs> it's good enough for me. It's not a shark. Mako no, is a Mako's a great Japanese actor. actor. Yes. And, and there's a just a heartbreaking scene with Mako in it. But yeah. and, and of course, Papillon. Papillon. Dustin Hoffman. Right. And Nevada the, Smith. Nevada Smith. And Le Mans. Le Mans. Obviously, everyone knows Steve McQueen was a big racing fan, drove a lot himself. Yeah. And the towering Inferno. <laughs> Had everybody in it. Everybody. Yeah. O.J. Simpson. Paul Newman. Towering Inferno. And then there's Ben Johnson. Oh, who, ben, ben Johnson. He, he's been around forever. He started in 1939, believe it or not. Wow, really? And, I didn't know you went that far back. And he's just got too many movies. We're just going to name a yeah, few. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the first thing I remember him in, and it's not a Western, he's in Mighty Joe Young. That's right. <laughs> Very good call. Yeah. He kind of worked with a lot of directors. John Ford yeah. loved him. He was in Three Godfathers. Right. She wore a yellow ribbon. Rio Grande. He was in Shane. Right. It's amazing. This and guy another shows one of, up everywhere. Another one of our favorites, John, Hang Him High. And then he starts working for Peckinpah, yeah. like he was in Major Dundee. And of course, The Wild Bunch. Oh, him He's, and Warren Oates, they, brothers. They, they work the so Bunch. well together. Yeah. He's the tough, you know, you know, broad-shouldered guy, and, and Warren Oates is his dopey little brother. Yeah, and as a kid, you think, when you're watching that movie, you think the brothers. Absolutely. They, they work so well together. They work together. perfectly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Last Picture Show. The Last Picture Show. And then one of our favorites- Dillinger. And Ali McGraw, the stunningly beautiful Ali McGraw, uh, who, who did not do a lot of movies. She was in Goodbye Columbus, Love Story. Yep. Convoy. Later on after this in Convoy. Yeah. yeah. And uh, The Peck and Paw uh, with, uh, with Chris Christopherson. And later she was actually a cast member of Dynasty. Oh. So she did a lot of television after that. At the time of this movie, she was actually married to producer Robert Evans. Yeah, Robert Evans is really a foolish man because he uh, he let her go off to Texas uh, and do a movie with Steve McQueen. Leaving her alone with Steve McQueen was a big, big mistake. What can you expect? Exactly. And they, they actually ended up divorcing and Steve McQueen married Ellie McGraw. Unfortunately, he wasn't too nice to Ellie McGraw. Yeah. But, which I, I'm sorry to hear, but um, uh, they're terrific in the movie together. So they you, play Doc you, and Carol McCoy. Right. They're married. Married crime family. <laughs> the opening credits I love in this movie. And, and the opening credits go on, John. I, I time them. They're, they're, they go on for almost nine minutes. Probably one of the <laughs> longest credit sequences I've ever seen. It's very peck and paw. It is, absolutely. And, and he's got this great eye for detail. Well, it's shot at Huntsville, a real penitentiary, Huntsville Penitentiary in Texas. In Texas, okay. Uh, the, the whole movie takes place in Texas. What I love about it is 
you have the beginning of the movie is this sort of chirping birds, this pastoral scene, and you see all these deer in this yard. And the camera pulls like back. Like on a lawn. Then the, you pull back and the deer are in the prison, just yeah. wandering around the grounds. Well, it pulls back and you see like eight identical wings of this prison. Yeah. It's like very industrial looking. And the like soundtrack, f- there's no music. You hear this machinery going. <laughs> Yeah. And you hear it, they once they bring it in the soundtrack because it's this quiet sound, and all of a sudden you hear that sound. Yeah. And then they go inside, and it's Steve McQueen at this like industrial weaving machine. Yeah. The sound is deafening. Yeah. You don't hear anything but that sound. And we, we cut back and forth to, to, to the machinery and the monotony of the machinery and him just yeah. turning it on and turning it off. And this is his whole life. And then I love how it's cut because you have these flashbacks between him and Ally McGraw, you know, yes. basically being intimate together. Yeah. And well, this- he's got several things going on. Like, it's almost it's like intercut with him being walked to his parole hearing. Right. As you said, him in the factory. You hear he's in the yard walking around and they're yeah. t- they're already, they've begun the hearing, the parole hearing. I mean, if Peckinpah is known for one thing... I don't think it's talked so much about a lot of his slow motions talked about, but this intercutting of things happening really simultaneously. Great. And he's got a great eye setting yeah. up shots. What he focuses on is really yeah. terrific. It reminds me of Scorsese in that way because this great eye for detail. So this whole, as you say, nine minute scene takes place and it's basically surrounding his parole hearing. He walks in. Yeah, almost yeah. no dialogue except for the, that, that one little piece where the, it's the parole hearing. He doesn't say a word, but he does catch the eye of... So Jack Binion, he catches his eye, but there's this whole board of white guys, stiff white guys, and the only thing said is, request for parole denied. Right. Uh, try try again in another year, basically. And then the cut goes back to him, you know, at the machines again, and, yeah. and, and the close-up on the machines, and the oil oil machines moving, and all these these fibers stuck on the machines. But you see his frustration, <laughs> like he hits the, hand, the, the control of the machine. Right. With, that's the only thing he does. He doesn't, like physically overtly doing it, but his hand just like smacks right. this control. And turns you cut on, to him building this bridge with, with matchsticks, matchsticks. pictures he, of his wife in bed. It, it's really beautifully yeah, cut. Yeah, it's cut in, he's, he's sort of like fantasizing and remembering back, memory cut, and, and but it's just that the noise gets louder and louder. Continuously, and it's the monotony, and then they're out yeah. doing work details, and they, they got to hand, you know, they got to hand their boots to the, oh, they take their boots off when they come back from the work detail. Yeah. All this regimented living, and when he's making this little model with the matchsticks, finally it all just comes yeah. crashing down on him, and he crumbles it up, and the next scene we see is him walking down this corridor on a visiting day. Right. And, and, and his wife, uh, Carol, comes up. Is, she's behind the glass. And she's going to talk to him. Hello, Doc. I'm sorry. And he says, get to Binion. Tell him I'm for sale. His price. Do it now. Yeah. And he gets up and he walks away. No goodbye. By everything that's happened up to this moment, he cannot spend another second in this jail. She's seeing Binion to say, look, Doc wants out. And we noticed, I just have to say, Binion is the guy from the parole hearing. Who was sitting saying nothing. Right. But he was eyeballing Steve McQueen. So, so clearly has, he's got some pull. He's got pull, he's got power, and he's, he's also on the parole board. And when Ali McGraw or Carol walks into the room, he stands up and he buttons his jacket like he's some kind of gentleman. Yeah. He's a total creep. <laughs> so we, we cut to Doc in the prison, and he's, he's in a suit and tie, and uh, he's walking along with a guard down this uh, hallway with bars on either side. So it's it's obviously still in the prison. And Doc watches the gate. He's kind of, his head pans as we see the gate go in the last few feet and yeah. it clicks open. And he pauses. It's almost like he takes a breath. I'm free. And he just walks out. But I just love McQueen's way of doing it. Some other actor might stand there and just have this tough macho kind of look or something. Yeah. But he looks vulnerable, and at the same time, he's got this this cool way of just looking at it until it's fully open, so he's yeah. guarantees out. I love that. <laughs> so Carol picks him up. She shows up a little late. She got her hair done, she says. Right. She's like, where do you want to go? And he goes, take a, a walk. walk. Yeah. And cut to- with some, some park by a river or something. And what's really great is is you watch Steve McQueen just, he seems almost shell-shocked. 
In fact, he doesn't even wait for her to park the car. Yeah. The car's still rolling and he's already getting out the door. He just wants to be out and about and walk around. Well, Peck and Pop cuts to all these great shots of all these people, different types of people. Some like kids running by, some couples, some teenage girls in bikinis yeah. and whatnot. It's like a whole slice of life kind life. of thing. Yeah. It's life outside of the bar. It's like, it's, and it must seem so strange to Steve McQueen. He looks disoriented. Yeah. And then he watches this this young kid, this this boy, run and grab this rope that's attached to a tree on, on the bank of the, yep. the river, and he goes flying and splashing into it. Slow-mo. And then he, the way I see it is he envisions himself with Carol doing the same thing. Well, there's, again, there's a lot of this intercutting. Is it like a flash forward? I was, I, I, yeah. You could take it as a flash forward, but I always saw it as, because he's yeah. just looking there right. at all this ideal, this ideal setting. But you know, I just want to make a point. You know, I, I, I saw this in 1972 when I was 12, and this made a huge impression on me. And, I, and every time I've seen this movie since, I always think, I would like to be swimming in, in the water with <laughs> Ali McGraw. There you, you go. Know? So so Steve McQueen finally gets up, and he runs, grabs the rope, and just goes into the water. And, and actually, he doesn't grab the rope. He just jumps in, right? He just dives in. Dives in. They, and they, then we cut, and they're entering... Her apartment. Right. They're all wet. Yeah. Obviously, they did go yeah. through with it. Yeah. And, you know, she's trying to make him feel at home. What do you want for dinner? And he's like, drinks. Whiskey, 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 he says. Yeah. Three times. Four times. Four times? Okay. But you can see on his face there's something troubling him. He's not quite comfortable. He goes up to the bedroom with her. Yeah. And he's like, you go out much? He right. answered that. That's where the question starts. Exactly. Yeah. Because he's really disoriented being there. And she says to him, well, you know, four years is a long time, Doc, yeah. but I'm still here. They go sit on the bed and you think it's going to be some sort of a, a big love scene or something. No. And they're sitting there. I like the way the shot is set up. Their backs are to us and they're both sitting there with, you know, with no shirt on. And you can see their expressions in the, the dresser mirror. And he seems nervous. And she's just looking at him like, well, what's, what's wrong? And he says, it does something to you. Yeah. It does something to you. Being in there, it does something to you. I could really feel for this character at that yeah. point because I can't imagine being in prison for that long doing that. It's a really human scene. What's interesting about the movie is it's it's a crime drama, but it's also a movie about their relationship. Exactly. And here, he's been away for four years. They're just feeling each other out. It's like a relationship beginning again. She says, I'm, I'm, I'm just as nervous as you are. Yeah. It's like they literally have to start their marriage over from here. Yeah. So then we cut to uh, Binion. And yeah, he's, he's on this river barge. So they're, I'll tell you, they're in San Antonio. I've been there. Okay. And what this have is- Have you had is, the lunch on the barge, John? Not on it, but just beside. <laughs> okay. It's, it's called the River Walk. And in the middle of San Antonio is this canal system that kind of goes in a big circle through downtown. It's beautiful. Yeah. And it's just lined with- restaurants and coffee shops and this and that and so this guy is a big wig he rents his own little barge yeah at lunch and doc shows up and he's like you're kidding you gotta me, be right? kidding me right yeah like, what the hell and so they get on and they're gonna float down this they're floating down this canal and they're basically talking about this bank job this is the last time we see each other in public yeah you want to deal with anything else, you deal with my brother, and Mr. Mr. Creepy. It's kind of comical because it pulls back into this wide shot, and you see all the henchmen yeah. on these little paddle boats trying to follow the barge. <laughs> it's like goofy. <laughs> like, what the hell? It's such a funny, quirky scene, the way they shot it. So Binion says, you're back with your own people now. Got some professionals. And Doc says, I get my own men. But that's not cool for Binion. No, he's in control. He's the money guy. You run the job, but I run the show. Yep. And don't you forget it. <laughs> and that's when we get introduced to Rudy Butler and Frank, Frank Jackson. Jackson. Rudy Butler is played by Al Latiri. And, and the two movies I, I really have indelibly in my mind with him is, is The Getaway yeah. and The Godfather. Yeah, he's, I mean, he's, he's done a bunch of TV, but, he's done but other those, things, those are the two movies. Those are the two yeah. movies that stand out. And, he, and he's he's terrifying in both. He's terrifying in The Godfather. And he, when you first see him, you could not ask for a more douchey guy. It just You just you know, know the slide look on his face. He's just going to be prick. an asshole. Yeah. yeah. And then there's Bo Hopkins. Bo Hopkins. Who's a Peckinpah regular. I actually think he used to be a stuntman, and that's where he got involved with Peckinpah. Um, he's got a pretty long career. He's done a lot of television. Yeah. But, but he was in American Graffiti. 
he was the the head pharaoh, the, the gang. Yeah, yeah, who, yeah I remember. Get, so we're introduced to these two guys, and and you know Steve McQueen is less than enthusiastic because he can see at least, yeah. at the very least, in this guy Rudy, he's got trouble. Well, he asked him about this job, previous job, and clearly someone got caught, and he's like, "What happened?" And and you know, the other guy didn't make it. Yeah, just like that, nonchalant, and so. You can tell, and the wheels are going on in McQueen's head. He's, uh, yeah. or, or I should say, Doc's head. Again, we just cut, and we're we're at the bank. Yeah, Doc is uh, he's casing the bank, and uh, it's a great little piece that Quincy Jones does. It's this sort of, uh, it's kind of a ten ten wins, you know, W I N S. Right. That's that kind of sound, and it and it really gets under your skin, and it gets your heart pumping. And uh, and 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 Doc goes in, and he's eyeballing. This guy putting up wanted posters, which is, you know, kind of saying to you, um, you, you better be careful about how you're doing that. Right. Unless you want to get back into uh, the pen. So he gets, uh, he walks up and he gets a uh, change for 50. You know, so he's casing the joint. He's, he's looking, he's looking at the safe and getting the make and the model and getting a sense of that whole thing and what's got to be done. So, so then there's kind of this intercutting again. Right. Parallel cutting of different scenes happening of, of this small little gang getting ready. So, and then we cut to them and they're in this little back room somewhere. Yeah. Doc is laying out the plan. And, and, and Rudy and Frank, they're not paying attention at all. In fact, you know, at one point. Um, uh, well, Frank's got, at the beginning, he's got the ski mask over his head. Right. Oh, it's like a, little, like a two year old. <laughs> yeah. Just playing with stuff. Then he combs his hair. You know, Doc, Doc gets really pissed. So he says, look, to Rudy. I handle the fine stuff. You're back up all the way. And Rudy, in his usual character, says, whatever you need, brother. And you know right there and then yeah. that, that Doc is screwed. Right. He's not going to cooperate for shit. So. Well, and the other thing, like Doc is like the consummate professional. Yeah. And he can't bear people not paying attention, doing this or that. Like he pulls out the... Uh, Bulletproof vests. Right. And back then, they were these big lead things that were yeah. kind of heavy. Yeah. And Rudy's right away, it's like... I haven't used one in 10 years. Yeah. I don't use those. And Doc's like, right away, suit yourself, man. Yeah. You know. But Doc is being smart about this. He's setting up the thing in such a way that they'll get away with it. Yeah. And they, nobody will get killed. Right. Rudy's like, oh, aren't you going a little hard for this one? That's a walk in the bank, man. You don't have to be Dillinger <laughs> to do this. And, and Doc says, Dillinger got killed. Yeah. And of course, Rudy says, not at a bank. Rudy always has the comeback. Yeah. He's one of those guys. He's got to get the last word in. And then Rudy really creepily takes his flashlight and he shines it into Doc's face and Carol's. Bang, he says. Like, how creepy is that? Yeah. But at the end of the scene, we have Binion's younger creepy brother. And he's standing there and Doc is telling him, okay, this is the way it's going to be done. This is the way it's going to be done. This is the way it's going to be done. And if you do it any other way, the handoff for the cash is not going to happen. Right. You need to tell him it yeah. has to be done that way. And as he stares him down, the guy stares him back down and then turns and walks away. Then Doc, after the guy's gone, he wipes his face off from the sweat he's right. just worked up yeah. from staring this guy down because he knows this is dangerous shit. He's so cool throughout the scene so right. it's really interesting to see him suddenly tense at the end. But just him just sweat. him just wiping the sweat from his yeah. face. You know, with with Steve McQueen's, you know, you know, face of nothing yeah. could be wrong, but his whole face changes like holy shit. That was really rough. And then we cut to the day of the robbery. Again, this is another scene. There's a lot of things going on. This is typical Peck and Pa. The whole movie's so great like this because 50 things are going on at once, but the way they cut it all together, you're jumping back and forth, you're going here or there. Because you have all these fits, components. Like clockwork. You have you know? all these yeah. components because they, they want to make these diversions yep. around town. So that they have to set up these explosives in that truck, for instance, right. that, that they You bought. see the truck filled with hay bales. Right. Frank drives it and parks it next to a barn. You're like, what the hell's that for? You know, he gets in the car and goes away with uh, Rudy. Doc and Carol are in a van, almost like the uh, the van from Scooby Doo. You know, like, and she suddenly stops in the middle of the street. She pulls up over the manhole cover. Yeah, and, and there's a hole in the van of the right, truck. Right, the floor of the truck. And then she flicks a switch that's that uh, stops. It's like a dummy switch. Right, that stops the car from being able to right. have the ignition go through because she wants to be phony about the car stalled yeah. 
to make it long enough for Doc to go down through the manhole yep. and then do his work on the electrical systems. So we see him down straight. there. He's got this big bolt cutter, and he, he cuts basically the power to the area. But what I love about Steve McQueen is no matter what he's doing, riding a motorcycle, yeah. shooting a gun, uh, working on machine parts on a battleship, or cutting the right cables yeah. to knock out all his power, he looks like he's the guy for the job. He, he's Mr. Cool. <laughs> he's Mr. Cool. <laughs> um, and then uh, you see Rudy and Frank enter the bank, right. and they start hurting people. There's an old guard in the bank, and I he knocks him to the ground. Yeah. Doc gets back in the truck. Right. He's like, come on, let's go. And of course, the truck stalls. <laughs> Can't get it started. He's yeah. like, come on, get it on. And, and she suddenly peels out. Right. And, and you see him, I think there's an important point, put his vest on. You bet. And over that, an overcoat, he's like no, a raincoat. He's no fool, yeah. yeah. So they open the back door. Yeah. Rudy opens the back door for Doc. Yep. Doc comes in to take care of the safe, basically. I mean, he walks directly to the yep. safe. He's the guy. You, you see uh, Frank by the front door. Right. And he's holding the gun on the people, and right. he's looking at the guard on the floor. Right. There's the one thing that gets me. that There's a gun that the guard has dropped, and it's like three feet from his hand. Right. Why don't you just pick it up and take it away? Well, this is the problem I have with Frank. Frank just didn't want to pay attention. Yeah. <laughs> He's you know? messing with that hat you know? and that comb. He's having fun, combing his hair. You See know? what happens, Bob, when you don't pay attention Looking to Looking at his fingernails. <laughs> That's exactly right. So fr- he didn't pay attention. That's what drove me crazy about that. And, and you know, so the, the, the job goes like clockwork. Yes. Everything's perfect. And then yep. you got to have the security guard, the old-timer security guard. He's going to save the day like freaking Superman. Oh, my God. Why? <laughs> Why? So so Frank just over I think overreacts. Yes. And he just shoots him. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah. And you know, basically it's game over now. That's yeah. not just in out, take the cash and go. Well Rudy is upset. Now it's murder. Rudy yells at him. He's yeah. like, Why what did you do that for? And he pulls him and he takes him out the front. So Doc takes the money, goes out the back door, Carol's in the car, and they split. And then we cut we're with Rudy and Frank in the car. So Rudy says, as they're driving away, yeah. take the wheel. So Frank reaches over, yep. takes the wheel, and Rudy takes out this gun, puts it in his crotch, and blows him away. And then shoots him two more times, and then kicks him out the door. Nice guy. And again, it's a nice little peck and paw shot. Slow motion. The car's making a turn, slow motion. You see this guy he rolling rolls out the on door the ground, onto the pavement. And yeah. it's on this kind of busy little street. It's in the middle of the day. Yeah. And what a douche. Like the guy, when you first meet these two guys, you get the sense they're like partners. They've been together right. for a little bit. Rudy's nobody's partner. No. no. It's like only- He's in it for himself. Wow. He's a scary guy, man. Poor Bo Hopkins. In The Wild Bunch, he's part of the gang. But it, only in the first scene. Right. He's one of the first people to get <laughs> yeah. killed. The guy can't get through <laughs> half a movie with Peck and Bob. Peck and Bob likes to kill this guy off. Early in <laughs> yeah. the movie. He's the guy. <laughs> Um, it's it's kind of like in Star Trek if if the if the the guy going down below does not have <laughs> does not is like ensign you know whatever right, the heck his right, name right. is he's go, he's gonna die <laughs> it'll be Spock Bones ensign so and so ensign so and so is dead that's it so he's I guess Bo Hopkins could have been on Star Trek so Doc and Carol pull up at this stop sign and there's this crossing guard and and your heart is pounding yeah because you know all right they're bank robbers and whatnot but still you're you're in in that feeling of them yeah and you're going come on come on he knows he's looking at his watch that the next explosion is going to take place right in, in 15 seconds and you're waiting uncharacteristically he was nervous yeah for doc yeah and finally he does peel out he right. can't wait anymore well it, it, there's a there's a, a, a some kids yeah and the the crossing guard actually moves in front of the car to say hey <laughs> you better stop here so finally the old lady gets past and he peels out because yeah. he knows that thing's going to explode and it's going to just... Well, you realize boom. why he's rushing because he peels off down the street and, and simultaneously this bomb goes there's off. There's a wall of fire that comes yeah. out. Yeah. And he drives through the wall of fire. He can't see anything. And, and, and Steve McQueen, you just you just know he's driving this car because you yeah. can just feel every bit of tension. Yeah. And, and, and Ali McGraw's looking at him like, 
oh my God, it, this this isn't really happening, is it? Well, he kind of loses control. He's he loses, trying to swerve around. Right, because he, he's in the center of town. He hits a couple of different things. He almost yeah. hits a couple of kids. And then he swerves again and he comes up very, it seems very Hal Needham to me, but yeah. right, right up on that porch and he demolishes all the pillars on the porch. Yeah, right over it. <laughs> it's beautiful. And then the car stalls and he's in a paddock. Shit. <laughs> Finally gets started and, he, and, they, and they take off. Yeah. And then we cut to Rudy. He's pulling into some farm. Some farm or something, right. And, uh, and of course, you see Rudy loading his big-ass revolver. It's like right. some kind of magnum. Right. And he's standing there as Doc and Carol pull into this farm, and he's got the gun, like, conspicuously behind right. his back. Right. It's like, right. who are you fooling, yeah. Rudy? Yeah. <laughs> and Doc gets out, and very shiftily, I think, he has his gun out, but it's behind the bag. We don't see we don't see him do that, but no. but you know, Doc's but you no can fool. see his hand is behind Doc this is bag. behind a bag. And Doc asks, you know, where's where's Frank? And Rudy says, He didn't make it. Neither did you. And he goes to fire and Doc just boom, boom, Beats boom. Beats him boom. to the draw. Right. Hits him four times. And he goes flying into this ditch. Yep. Down. But just before Doc drives away with Carol, he steps up to, to a vantage point on the door yeah. where he can actually shoot down at right. Rudy. And he shoots just above his head to see if he's going to flinch or move. And and me, as a viewer, as an yeah. audience member, I'm thinking, that guy didn't move. He's got to be dead. But he shoots one more time. Yeah. And he nails him in the collarbone. Yep. And you see the body go, boom, and just roll over. And I and thought, you see well, blood. that's the you end of that. So if he wasn't dead. dead before, he is now. Yeah. And just before Doc and Carol drive away, there's a fly in his hand. And he twitches. So Rudy ain't dead yet. I was upset that Doc would not just walk up to that ditch and really make sure there's a bullet to the head. But I get the feeling I get the feeling that Doc doesn't like that assassin sort of thing. I got a piece of trivia for you. Okay. They're driving up and there's a roadblock and they got all the money. And there's a song playing on the radio. What song is that? Just an old fashioned love song. Who's singing the song? You know what? It's funny. I couldn't think of the name, and I wrote here, Bob will know. <laughs> I, I can picture the guy with the glass, short guard glasses. That's it. His name. What's his name? It's Paul Williams. Who Paul wrote the, Williams. He wrote the song. Now, that's yeah. a, it's a Three Dog Night hit. Yes. Paul Williams was a songwriter, and he wrote a lot of songs, and, and he's actually singing that song in that one. So there you Which go. is kind of a funny song in this movie, because it is <laughs> yeah. partly about their relationship. It is. Yeah. It is. So, yeah, Doc and Carol go to Binion's, and basically Binion's is upset that the guard got killed, things went right, kind of haywire. He said, your wife said no one would get killed. But when he says that, to me, and you see Doc at this look, he kind of tips off to Doc that Carol and Binion have done more than meet just once because she made it sound like they just met once. So Doc and Binion are talking, and Doc is starting to split up the money. And while they're talking, we see Carol make her way past them behind Doc. Yes. And she's standing there with a gun. She's pointing it at Doc. And you can see the smarmy face on on Binion because yep. he thinks, okay, well, this is the plan. We're going to do in Doc and we're going to take the money for ourselves and right. everybody's going to be happy. But Carol decides no. So she just puts the gun on Binion and shoots him boom, 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 yeah. four times, and he goes flying backwards. Doc and, is surprised. He yeah, turns he sh- around. He, because, you know, he's lying there dead, and, and, and they just turn and look at each other. And in the shot, you have Binion dead on the right, yeah. and you have the two of them just facing off. And yeah. you're thinking, wait a second, what, what the heck's going on here? And then we just cut away. Right. And that's when we see Rudy pulling up to this animal clinic, right. beeping his horn, and this... Sheepish vet and his ditzy wife come out. Jack Dodson plays <laughs> the character of Harold. He's the vet. I, I remember him basically as, as the, uh, the county clerk on the Andy Griffith show, Howard. Yeah. And, uh, and his, his cute little blonde wife is Sally Struthers. From? Who is uh, rather uh, bodacious in this movie. And yes. And very different than the little Goyle we know from All in the Family. It's a totally different role. Huh? Absolutely. So Doc is, they're in the car. Doc and Carol, and he's pissed. So he's putting this stuff together in his head. What right. what happened between my wife and this guy Binion? I got to say the the idea of beautiful Allie McGraw, Carol, uh. being with this older, 
creepy guy. Yeah. He's just so sleazy. I can't even imagine that she would for a second even yeah. consider, huh, I think I'll throw over hunky Steve McQueen for this guy. Yeah. No matter how much the money situation is. So, so uh, it's something that's always bothered me about the movie. I love the movie, but it, well, it's something that's always bothered me about that's it. Why, that's why Doc is so pissed. And yeah. he pulls off the road finally. She's crying. He gets her out the car and he just, traffic's going by. He just starts slapping her, yeah. like, like methodically. Yeah. He gives her a slap, 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 but he really wants to punch her out is what he wants to do. He's yeah. so angry about this situation. But, you know, as she she kind of calls him on, he's like, why didn't you tell me? And she's like, y you sent me to him, right. basically. What did you expect? How do you think you got out, Base is what she's trying to say. Yeah. You sent me to him, and you're that's the reason you're out. Yeah. So he throws her back in the car. He's like, God damn you. Like, as if he has no blame here. And again, as we said... Although this is about bank robbers, this film is also about... It's really great how it's... We see how the relationship the kind of goes through also. all these changes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, absolutely. This is the interesting thing, too. It, you know, because you you always think in terms of Peck and Paul, or at least his reputation is, you know, it's this violence and violence and right. violence. And there's a lot of violence in the movie. Yeah. But there's so much stuff between the relationship yeah. and, the, and the sensitivity yeah. of both characters. And then we cut to the train station. I love this scene. They have the money, but now they want to get out of there. So we're going to get some 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 train tickets and get out of there. Right. And she's really uptight. Carol's really uptight. And she's sitting there with the bag, and there's all this noise going on all over the place. There's a screaming baby, and there's a slamming of, uh, of a locker. And she's so jumpy from this whole thing. But the way it really gets heightened is the way it's cut back and forth yeah. between Doc going up around and around in the parking garage and it's screeching tires, screeching tires. So it's it's cut back and forth with these screeching tires that, that really get on your nerves. She wants to not worry about the money. Right. She wants to put it in a locker or something. Yep. So she <laughs> walks over to the locker. She's kind of fumbling. And this, uh, money out this and very nice gentleman with a cowboy hat comes over and- uh, Texas cowboy suit. In cowboy hat. Right. And he's, you know, he's he's Mr. Gentleman. And yeah, so, you know, sure. These things are kind of tricky. So he he helps her open the thing and then locks it and gives her the key yep. and walks away. And she goes, gets a drink. Yeah. And that's, by the way, uh, a great actor, Richard Bright. The movie that comes <clears throat> to mind is he was in The Godfather. All three Godfathers, actually. But yes. Well, I was going to say The Godfather and Godfather 2. I, I, he I, is in 3. I try briefly. not to think about 3 too much. <laughs> <laughs> it it exists. I know, but I try not to it think about it. It cannot not exist. It exists. I don't have to acknowledge it. <laughs> so now now Carol's up in the um, the lounge and having a, a drink, and Doc comes up to her and says, "You know, come on, let's get going." Yeah. Where's you know where's the money? By the way, it's in a locker. Don't worry about it. So they go to the locker, and it's open. It's open. There's no bag. There's no bag. Yep. He takes the key. Yeah. And he goes to the other locker. Right. And you know in her head, she's probably going, maybe it's a please, man. Please, 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 please. He opens it, nothing. nothing. Yeah. Well, she's like, a man helped me open it. And he goes, uh, it's the oldest con in the world. Yep. He switched keys with you. Yeah. How long ago was this? I don't know, 15 minutes ago. Well, he probably doesn't think you're on to him yet. Let's let's go look for him. Yeah. And, and, and what's great is as they're looking for him, you know, they're looking for a guy in a cowboy hat. And almost every guy in the entire <laughs> train has a, has a cowboy hat. So, so you you know you feel the tension because she, she must be so upset. It's suitcase full of money. It's $500,000. Yeah. So Steve McQueen, you can see the wheels turning. I got to yeah. find this guy. And he is in the process of pulling the same damn thing on somebody else. Cut to him with yeah. some old lady. Yeah. Let me help you with that. Pulling the same <laughs> damn thing on somebody else. And the guy sees him and, and just takes off. Takes off. He runs out to the platform. There's a train loading. Doc is right behind him. And then there's this kind of little chase scene. He's on the train. He's kind of going through the cars, going through the cars. They're both trying to get through the crowd. Yes, snaking their way through. Snaking through people, whatever. And, and it's packed. Finally gets to the end car, and that's it. There's nothing And it's there. locked. Yep. He can't even remotely budget. So he comes back, and he starts picking at this lock. For the bathroom. And he finally he gets in there, and, and Doc... Checks the door. And, and he's heading. He's like, where the fuck this guy go? He's heading back. And there's a conductor who's like, the bathrooms don't open till the train's moving. So Doc's like, shit. And then he gets off. And he's looking around. He's standing there. And, and you're so tense. Your heart is beating because you're going, shit. 
he's going to lose the money. They're the train the starts money. moving. Train starts moving. He's looking back and forth, back and forth. And there's a great shot. I love this shot. Yeah. There's a baggage carrier. All these, all this baggage on it, and it starts to take up the entire frame as it comes toward the camera. And suddenly, you can't really see Steve McQueen anymore because this has blocked the shot. And as right. it starts to pull out of the frame, you catch the tiniest wisp of the back of his coat. It's like he's like the, the masked Avenger or something. You right, see the right. whip of the coat <laughs> go into the train. Yeah. And you know he made it back on. Exactly. So he's going to somehow <laughs> find this guy. And so you cut to the cowboy, and he he finally gets to open the back. He starts looking through it, and suddenly he realizes he oh, just my hit God. the lottery. <laughs> you bet. He cannot believe it. Unfortunately for him... Doc appears right behind him coming into the car, and he sits down right next to him. When you work on a lock, don't leave any scratches. I love this scene because, you know, this guy has it coming. Yeah. Steve McQueen, pissed off, he beats the living shit with his elbow. With his fucking pow, elbow. Pow, 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 pow. And, and 10 feet in front is the conductor collecting But Steve tickets. McQueen is cool as a cucumber. He just yeah. beats the shit out of him, and then he takes the cowboy hat and puts Stuff. it down over the, the, the guy's face. Yeah. And the guy's knocked out. I mean, he just he's yeah. just completely trashed him. So they get back to the train station, Doc right. and Carol, right. and they got the money. But he's he's pissed. And he's, he's basically, you know, if you're trying to get me back into Huntsville, you're going about it the right way, meaning prison. Right. And she's like, don't worry, Doc. I can screw every official in Texas to get you out if I have to. And he says, I, I bet you can. <laughs> so he's still burning yeah. from this whole Binion thing. They pull into this town and Doc's, well, he, he wants a radio. He walks into this little TV repair Appli shop. A, a TV repair, yeah. appliance stuff. How much do you rate those? 15 to $37. Give me the $15 one. Yeah. And the guy goes to get the radio, and sure enough, on the 10 TVs in the shop. On the, on the counter, there's a television <laughs> running. Because you used to see this all the time in, yeah. in a television repair yeah. shop or, or a department store. They'd have all these televisions on, so you could see what the yep. televisions look like. So on the, on the counter, the television's on, the sound is on, and the reporter's talking about the bank robbery. Yep. And he pays for the ra radio, and then he looks around. And we can see in all the television set, there's his mugshot. His mugshot. He's, he's busted. Like, he's like, fuck. What's funny, it's a great scene. He walks out and he walks down the street. To a sporting like, goods store. How's it going? A gun shop. Sporting goods. And hey, it's Texas. And it's the early 70s before <laughs> gun control. He walks right in, I need a shotgun. He goes, give me some of those double odd six. And the guy says, what are you going to do? Knock down a wall? <laughs> <laughs> so the clerk starts wrapping the gun. Well, I love that. I, I love I love the wrapping it in brown paper. It's, yeah. just, it's it's very quaint. But I have to say one thing about the guy who's the, the gun uh, shop owner. He keeps trying to get Steve McQueen, uh, Doc, to uh, to fill out the form. Fill out the form. <laughs> yeah, you got your name. Yeah. <laughs> so while that's happening, of course, two deputies in a police car right. pull up outside and they see this. They see the car. Yeah. Carol, she's gotten out of the car. She's standing on the sidewalk. Right. Doc comes out of the store. And he walks behind the, uh, the building. And you can see him through the, actually through yeah. the, the department store window. The corner window, yeah. Corner window, he's, he's around the side. And he, he's got this, you know, this gun wrapped up. And he walks up right to the cop car. And Doc just lets loose. Yeah. Ba-boom. Just shoots the hell out of the back of the police car. And what I love about Peck and Paul in this case, once again, this is this yeah. is attention to detail. I mean, you know, okay, it's slow motion violence and whatnot, but he he takes these little elements yeah. and the way he does it yeah. and points out these different things that are exploding, the different components to the car that really disable the car is really what makes the scene for me. And he's kind of slowing down time because right. obviously it's slow mo, but suddenly he cut to all these faces like kids, like what's going on, right. peering out a window right. or around a corner. And that really reminds me of a western. Yeah, you know, like exactly. it, the gun, the gunslingers will be out right. there. They're 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 shooting it out or something, and you see somebody peering. You know, some old lady with a bonnet hat or something peering yeah, through yeah, the curtains. Yeah, that's a and good there's point. A lot, and there's a lot of that. It's like a modern western. Yeah. And so he's got the drop on these two guys. He's right. like, put your guns down, get in the gutter. Lie in the gutter. I love that. <laughs> he didn't just say lie down in the lie in the gutter. And I love how he just then calmly walks around to the front of the car, just calmly. Steve McQueen with his big ass gun blows the front of this car. The radiator bursts. You see yeah. all the water pour yeah. out. Yeah. The the trunk goes up in the yeah. air. He just he just does a number on on the car. He he walks away after doing this, and the and the the, the two cops are lying in the gutter, and 
you see one of the shells just start rolling toward <laughs> yeah, them. the empty shell. I love that. But he methodically takes apart the car. He disables it completely. It's like the radiator, the mirror, yeah. the top light. Yeah. And then he walks around to the back. He's reloading his gun. Yeah. And he gets to behind the police car and he shoots the gas tank. Yeah. And, the, and suddenly the thing just starts on fire. Yeah. And then he's going in to try and get in the car because the door is open. He wants to get in the back and Carol hits the gas and runs in reverse and knocks him down and the gun out of his head. I love that shot. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a random element to, to throw in there. It's great. And he says, what the hell's the matter with you? <laughs> Just what their relationship needs. <laughs> you know, all this tension and whatnot, but it's a funny scene. <laughs> what the hell's the matter with you? And you can see her frustration. She's like, damn. She taps the steering wheel like, shit, I didn't mean to do that. And he goes around the car. He's pissed. And he gets back in the car and they just peel yeah. out and, they, and they're off again. Yeah. So- during the course of time, yeah. Rudy has taken Fran and uh, hu- husband, the vet, Harold, uh, on a road trip. So his concept is we're going to get to El Paso to the Laughlin Hotel right. before Doc gets there. Because Doc doesn't even know he's alive exactly. at this point in time. Yep. So he's he's in the car with them and and driving. And, and poor Harold's just, you know, the sap who's <laughs> driving. And, and The whole time I'm watching this, I'm like, poor Harold. You're not in Mayberry anymore. Yeah. It's so sad. Yeah, because he looks like he's the same guy from Mayberry, (laughs) right? And the thing that's really creepy about it is you see bit by bit that Fran is really into Rudy, which really gives me the the, the creeps. Well, there's something about the danger she's attracted to. The danger of it and its excitement and it's not this little town. It's almost like she's been cooped up with this kind of boring vet. Right. And and now it's a chance for excitement. Right. You know? And and she really just drops poor Harold like a hot potato. <laughs> but no matter what he does to her and how sadistic he may be to her, she's still into him. Yeah. And they've turned this into sort of a cuckold relationship where right. they have poor little Harold tied up while they have sex. Now, we don't see the scene, but we know damn well fine what's been going on here. The next scene, Rudy's getting pissed at Harold for being in the bathroom for too, too long. Yeah. And he says, come on, Harold. You've been in there for 10 minutes. Let's go. <laughs> and, and, and he goes in there, and there's Harold. He's hung himself in the bathroom. And typical sweetheart Rudy, he just sits down, raises himself. On and, the crapper. And, and takes a dump. <laughs> right next to the right hanging, next to ha- body. hanging Harold. <laughs> you know, shortly after that, they're back on the road, just the two yeah. of them, and she doesn't really seem to care at all. It's <laughs> unbelievable. So meanwhile, Doc and Carol are on the road. It's nighttime. They pull into this drive-in food place, and right behind them, you see this cop car coming to the lot. Right. You know, suddenly Doc sees him. He just turns around, aims through the back window, and just blasts this police yeah. car. Doc is not playing any games. Oh, and no. if he, and if you kill them, that's too bad. So they they kind of get away. They get they turn down this side street and they're in this back alley and Doc sees this dumpster. dumpster. Yeah. And I have to say, this is like the third great escape in this movie. These guys, whoever wrote this, I don't know if it's in the novel, yeah. uh, it's amazing yeah. the way this criminal mind is thinking. You know, they just get Hide in the dumpster. dumpster. I mean, who would really think he would go into the dumpster, right? And he, you could see him putting all this refuse yeah. over them. Yeah. Uh, and, and But there's a problem, John. It's garbage pickup night. No. Oh. <laughs> and the garbage truck comes, <laughs> hooks up the dumpster they're in, yep. and puts it in the garbage truck. Comes over top. Yeah. And you see them yeah. in slow motion with the garbage just Tumble drop in. into this truck. But what's amazing to me is you have this garbage truck, filthy garbage truck, filthy dumpster. You have one of the biggest movie stars in the world. Yeah. I don't know, I don't know if they, they they painted it up or whatever. It looks filthy and disgusting. <laughs> I, I feel like I can smell it. Yeah. And, and you have one of the most beautiful actresses, one of the you know top leading ladies of the day. Right. They're, they're in a garbage truck. In, in the, the back truck. of it, in the truck. And what's cool is the thing starts compressing the garbage. Yeah. And they have to back up further into the truck. Right. Every time a dumpster gets into the truck, the truck compresses. Right. And they're backing up, they're right. backing up, and they start using these tubes to stop it. And they're breaking. I got to yeah. say, I think George Lucas took that scene for Star Wars. Oh, that's pretty funny. 
It rem- that's what it reminded me of. Absolutely. Yeah, I just, yeah. yeah. I, I know exactly <laughs> what you're talking about. Yeah. Because Luke tries to do something and he breaks the tube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you're right. Absolutely. But the, the thing is, once again, peck and pause, I, I for detail. Yeah. And, and yeah. You, you go to the, this hydraulic um, compactor. And you see the, the, the rod that's compacting it, and you just see it going close up there. And you see the close up of yeah. that. And then, and then they cut to them pushing frantically the stuff out. And then you see it cut back again, it, the compressor going. And then you see the guy on the, uh, with his hands on the control, you know, <laughs> right. you know, all this close up interaction of all this is going on. This guy's oblivious to what's going on. He has no idea. Yeah. But they are in a panic because. If this thing gets compressed enough, yeah, they'll die. Yeah, if 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 they don't get crushed, they'll suffocate because it's an amazing amount of garbage you fit in a garbage truck. And for the life of me, I think they shot it in a real truck. I can't imagine how they would do it otherwise. No. And so we cut to the next morning, right? And they're in this kind of barren dump. It's and the truck backs up into this hole, yeah. and you see it kind of tilt back and start dumping but all bef- the garbage. But, but the thing is, before. Before he starts to dump it, he's got to get out. The guy's got to get out, the driver, and he opens up the one door, and you see how much freaking garbage is in there. Yeah. This whole wall of yeah. trash, wall. just exactly. compressed trash, wall. just kind of falls out of the truck. Right. In in slow motion, all this stuff going into the hole, and there you see Doc and Carol falling, falling with, the with the garbage into this hole. Now, this is one shot. They're really in that truck. Yeah. That's a great shot. It's fantastic. Uh, I think what's really cool about what's next is you see Doc and Carol in the hole and all this trash is still falling from the truck. They have to seek refuge in this little Volkswagen, right? Half, half a Volkswagen. Half a Volkswagen. It's a piece of, you know, it's, it's like junk, it's garbage. But you look at them, they're all beat up. Filthy. They're scarred. Yeah. Their hair's like just she's, she's got a big dirt. scratch on it. So really great makeup job there. They didn't fake it. No, yeah. not at all. No, yeah. they, they they look filthy, and it's a great little scene there in uh, in, in in when they're in that uh, that Volkswagen because once again they're talking about their lives and what they're going to do and and maybe we should just break up and leave and 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 Carol says to him, I always thought jails made people hard, not you, boy. I mean, you're not just tough enough to forget about Binion. Yeah, I chose you. I mean, she finally just lays it out and yeah, says, yeah. I chose you. Yeah. And, you you know, you see him just soften. Well, he kind of sits, he's speechless. Yeah. And finally, he says, we pick it up and we leave. Meaning- We pick is, it up and we leave it here. Yeah. Or this isn't going to work. And, and it, they're kind of getting to a resolution here. And it's like, you know, no more about him is what she says. And I like how they, I like how they, they, there's a wide shot and they're walking along, they're holding hands. She actually, he actually leans over and gives her a kiss mm-hmm. and they, they, they walk along, it's a wide shot and there's this, it looks like burning tires or something in the yeah. back of the smoke and it, it's just anything but a romantic scene, but it works. I mean, you know? what a perfect counterpoint, right? Yeah, like exactly. Your, your love, your relationship kind of resolving itself. In, in the garbage dump. dump. Sure. And a real dump. It's yeah. not some fake no. Hollywood dump. No, exactly right. It's filthy. <laughs> so Doc and Carol, Doc calls up Laughlin at right. some point, and he's like, can you get me to Mexico? And so now we realize why Laughlin's is important, this guy Laughlin. He's the conduit to get sneak into Mexico, right. basically. So right after that phone call, we've seen Rudy and Fran check into Laughlin's before them. Right. And- Basically, Rudy threatens Laughlin. You better tell me when Doc shows up. And it's and and we've got to say, Laughlin is Dub Taylor. Dub Taylor, the actor. Dub Taylor was one of the consummate actors of the '60s and into the '70s. Yeah, and and he was in a whole lot of movies, but he just he he lends flavor to every movie right. he's in. He just has that certain quality, and he pretty yeah. much is the same guy with that same Southern accent. But he's terrific. He was in uh, a, a bunch of Peck and Balls, but the movie that. I always remember him in is Bonnie and Clyde. Oh, right. He is C.W. Moss's C.W.'s daddy. father. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Just prior to this, we've seen Binion's brother in the gang. They hop in 
to this, this. Big, this big, big old Cadillac, it looks like, or something. Convertible Cadillac. Convertible. Yeah. But it's also like these five or six big middle-aged guys squeezing into this one car. <laughs> it's like a goofy kitty car or something. It's like the banana splits or something. <laughs> what are they doing? The banana splits. Well, they, they, they look even more ridiculous because they're holding onto their hats the whole time. It's like a clown car. They all get in and drive on the highway. It's funny. The banana splits. <laughs> So then Rudy and has Fran knock on the door. He's going to get the drop on Doc. Right. Doc's telling Carol, stall, stall, stall. stall. He's trying to figure out he what he He knows something's do. wrong. So Doc gets his gun. He realizes he can go into the next room through the common door. He breaks, he breaks in, uses a credit card. Yeah. yeah. And he kind of picks the lock, yeah. gets through, yeah. and lo and behold, he looks out in the hall, and there's fucking Rudy yeah. still alive. Yeah. Holy shit. He's got his gun poised and ready. So Doc sneaks up on him and just knocks him out. Yeah. Why you don't blow his head open, I don't know. He just knocks him to the ground, knocks him out. I, I have to say that that at this point, Fran, Sally Struthers, was, yeah. was starting to drive me crazy. <laughs> Rudy, Rudy. I just, I, I have to say that I didn't mind Doc uh, silencing her for a little <laughs> while because she reminded me of and was driving me crazy almost as much as Shelly Winters in A Place in the Sun. So then Doc walks up and he he's puts his hand out to block the spray. He's going to blow Rudy's brains out, right? but he thinks better of it. I think partly because he didn't want to make any more noise. Maybe, and, and, maybe. And, you know, of, of nosy neighbors and whatnot in yeah. there. So he's just going to quietly get out of there. But as he gets to the stairs with Carol, he looks downstairs and... There's the gang. It's like they're surprised because he gets to the landing and they... they each of them look at each other. The gang looks up and there's Doc. They weren't expecting him. No, and he wasn't expecting them. Right. And, they, um, and they're loaded to the teeth. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so D- Doc just take, takes his shotgun out and right. just boom, and they all scatter. And Doc ducks up in the stairway. And then one of the henchmen who's got a machine gun, he's like walking to the stairway, like peeking up. And Doc shoots him, blows, blows him away, and he, he hits so hard back yeah. that, that he recalls off, the, off of the wall, and he just holds on to the trigger. <laughs> And he shoots up the newsstand, or the, the magazine stand. <laughs> it just goes everywhere. You know, all, all the girly magazines and stuff just gets splattered all over the place. But I love how like the action is in normal speed, and then soon as the shot goes off with the shotgun, right. things go in slow motion as people yeah. get hit. So there's a series of shootouts where Doc and Carol, actually, these guys are trying to go up the stairs, someone going up the elevator. Yeah, Carol, Carol blows this one guy away, and she yeah. uh, does a hell of a job, I got to say. But there's some. There's a really nice shot, again, where Doc shoots the guy with the cowboy hat yeah. in the stairwell. Yeah, yeah. It's just the way it's shot. It's, be- it's oh, I hate to say it's beautiful. It is. dies hitting him. Well, the interesting thing is this. You, you said it's beautiful, and there, it is beautiful in, in, its, in its own way. because In a the, cinematic way. The, in a cinematic way, right. Because I read years ago, in an interview with yeah. Peckinpah, and he said that the way he got the idea for this slow motion violence mm-hmm. was from the NFL films. Oh, interesting. Remember this yeah. this week yeah, in the yeah. NFL we used sure. to watch on Saturday nights? Definitely. It would be the review of last week's stuff. Definitely. With the great films. Yeah. And they'd have this, you know, uh, you'd see, I don't know, Johnny United <laughs> throwing the ball and they come and they... Boom, they'd hit him or something. Yep. <laughs> but the interesting thing is that Peckinpah is not really the first person to slow down violence. The first person that I can come up with is Kurosawa in Seven Samurai. Exactly. And it is beautiful. Yeah. And it is, it's poetic. Right. And the I way think he, he was does a big fan of Kurosawa, Peckinpah. Real, well, that makes sense then, too. Um, so. Yeah. So Doc and Carol make their way back to their room because there's one shot at the end where they're just coming down this empty hallway, and they don't know which way to turn because right. th- there could be people could be everywhere. Yeah. And they finally get to their room, and they're going to go out the back window right. to the fire escape. Down the fire escape. Mm-hmm. And lo and behold, Rudy is in the bathroom washing his face. So Doc and Carol are climbing down this fire escape. They're going to climb over this wall, and Rudy is going to take, this is his chance. He sticks. Perfect opportunity. Comes out of the window. Yep. And he... Takes a shot at Doc. I thought he hit him, but he didn't. Doc turns around. Boom. One shot right in the chest. Kills Rudy. Finally. That's Steve McQueen for you. I like how you just said, that's the end of Rudy. Finally. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't agree more. Right. This guy just keeps coming. Well, you got you to give Al, Al Latiri is a, a terrific actor because, boy, yes. oh, boy, does he play this, this guy to the hilt. Well, it's a great role for him because it is so different than Salazzo yeah. and The Godfather. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's got more range, I yeah. think. Yeah. 
So Doc and Carol are finally on the street, and they see this old, old pickup truck, and it's Slim Pickens driving. Slim Pickens. God bless him. Uh, we all know Slim Pickens. Absolutely. Uh, tons of movies. So famously, Dr. Strangelove. Dr. Strangelove. R- writes the bomb. Yeah. <laughs> into Russia. Um, Woohoo. But he goes way back. Did a lot of Westerns and whatnot. Yeah. So they find this guy. He's got this truck. And Doc's like, we're going to Mexico. This guy's like, you're not going to shoot me, are you? So the guys basically say, I know a quiet way in. I know a quiet border crossing. But what I love is at the border crossing. Yeah. At the border crossing. <laughs> He's got all his shit in the back, right? Yeah. <laughs> and and he's got to, you know, do you, are you going to claim anything at the border? They said, you know, what do you got in there? He goes, building materials. <laughs> I love that. But true to his word, it's a quiet border crossing. Right. And I was just thinking, you can't have that these days, right? There is no quiet border oh, crossing no. now. No, but no. Early no. 70s, you can just go into Mexico. They finally get to Mexico. They're in Mexico. Doc has, and Doc's like, pull over. Doc gets out of the truck, and, and Slim Pickens, like, gets on one knee, and he's, like, messing around with the dirt. Right, right, like, right. Aw, shucks. Yeah. Aw, shucks. And Doc's there sitting there talking, and how much do you make? He's like, suppose I, suppose I give you 10000 for the truck of yours. And, and, and the cowboy kind of kind of hemming and hawing about it, and he's like, what about twenty? And Doc kind of laughs. laughs. It's pretty ballsy of him. And then Carol says, what about thirty? <laughs> and a dog looks at her like, hey, you kidding me? And the cowboy's like, God damn, man, you got a deal. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, this whole end sequence with Slim Pickens, it just kicks it up a notch, Absolutely. Right? It, it just seals the it, movie. It makes it poignant. Yeah. Because, you know, he's he's looking at them as, as human beings. Yeah. And they look at him in, in the same way, and they're they're touched by him. Yeah, like to him, they're just two kids going off to start their life, right. you know? And he's just this great character. He, he's just, you know, you just feel for the guy. But it's Slim Pickens. It's his acting. It's the way he delivers the lines. It's the way he comes across. And he's not some crazy old coot or anything. No. He's no, just a no. guy that's lived a long life, yeah. you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's just a great ending. They're driving off literally, you know, down the road. Right. You know, the, is the credits roll. Since I was 12 years old, this is one of my favorite movies. And, it, yeah. and I have to say, you know, we were talking about it, doing this and stuff, and I, I rewatched it again recently. It loses nothing. I mean, as a kid, it's an action movie. It's sure. great. But as you're older and you're watching this relationship play out, it's really well written, that yeah, part it, of the movie. It only gets better. And, and I, and I got to say that, you know, Walter Hill is a hell of a screenwriter. Yeah. It's just a, it's a fantastic script. It's so well directed and, 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 and so well acted. All the components come together. The I'm, casting's fantastic. I Every mean, little part. If I'm going to say the top three McQueen movies, yeah. it's Great Escape, yeah. Bullet, and this. Yeah. I, I would have to, I have to, have to somehow work the sand pebbles into that because I love that, that movie. But yes, I agree with you 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Steve Marino at his coolest. Steve Marino. <laughs> Well, that's all the time we have this week. We'd like to thank our friend Glenn Ornowitz for his music. And of course our listeners for tuning in. So join us next week for another episode of Film Detour. If you like our show, please recommend us to your friends. Subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play and leave a review. Go to our website at filmdetour.libsyn.com to leave comments or email us with questions. That's filmdetour.lib.com syn.com You can also visit us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And you can also find us on YouTube.